So welcome to the Doctor and Health Coach first edition uh, chat. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Lorena Law. My name is Beth Wright, and we are really excited to launch this chat, this mm -hmm. initiative, yep. to speak about weight loss drugs. My first question to uh, Dr. Law is, what are these weight loss drugs? What are they mm -hmm. intended to do? And uh, what are some of the side effects? Okay, so basically when we're talking about weight loss injections, so these are the newer class of drugs that we've discovered since 2005. Um, so they're called GLP-1-RA. So that basically stands for glucagon-like peptides, one receptor agonist. <laughs> so it's a mouthful, and that's why we shorten it to GLP-1 receptor agonist. So basically the idea is the hormone or the peptide hormone glucagon like peptide one actually is released when you eat foods containing glucose and fats so the small intestine senses that and releases glp1 and that stimulates the pancreas to release insulin which then actually helps you to bring glucose levels down so that's one of the effects. The second effect is that GLP-1 actually slows down gastric emptying, which means that the food slows down in terms of absorption. So you feel satiated for longer. Now, the third action is really interesting because we also have these GLP-1 receptors in our brain, which actually helps us to uh, feel more satiated when we eat. So there are multiple ways that these weight loss drugs actually help us control appetite, which is quite different to what we used to use in the past, which are basically using stimulants. So um, we started using these drugs actually back in 2005 for managing type 2 diabetics. 20 years ago. Yeah, so they're not new drugs. They've been around for some time. So we have a lot of long-term data in type 2 diabetic um, patients. And so one of the benefits is managing glucose, but also we found through observing them for a long time that some of these patients actually also lost a lot of weight. Yeah. So then the first drug that was approved for weight loss was approved in 2014. So it's been 10 years in the making. Mm -hmm. So it's not new. <laughs> We've known about it for a long time, but I think celebrities have talked a lot about it recently. So it's become popularized. Yeah. So usually um, we use it to treat obesity. So that's defined as a BMI of over 30, or um, we actually also treat it in a BMI of patients over 27 that may have health conditions that would benefit from weight loss. Yeah. So things like having um, prediabetes, fatty liver, high blood pressure, sleep, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. These would be the indications why we might put someone on when the BMI isn't 30. Yeah. Would that include hormonal issues like PCOS? Uh, yes, so sometimes we yeah. also would because we know some types of PCOS patients also have difficulty losing weight because they're also insulin resistant. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those are also specific cases. Um, however, um, they are not without side effects. Yeah, let's talk about the side effects. Mm -hmm. What are the ones that you see most commonly in your patients who are on these weight loss drugs? Yeah. When we start treatment, we have to discuss about side effects because they're pretty common. About 60% yeah. of people will get some of these more common side effects. So then things like nausea, yeah. um, abdominal cramping, uh, constipation because you're slowing down the gut movement yeah. um, and also things like vomiting even. So these are discomforts that can be managed actually yeah so that's the reason why we want um, them to actually work with a nutritionist or a dietitian yeah. because they also have to manage how they're going to be able to eat enough food so that they're keeping the protein levels up and their energy levels up because these are drugs that help with lifestyle interventions as well it's not a replacement so we want them to also be active we also want them to think about um, long-term strategies that are sustainable so when you work with your clients, what are some tips that you actually have for them to help them increase their protein? Yes, it's, it's a really important point because a lot of these women or men who are on these weight loss drugs are not used to the feeling of being full yeah. or not being hungry. So that's an, a new feeling for them. And to override that by making somebody eat is a challenge. Yes. <laughs> um, I think the first port of call is always to emphasize education. Like right. why is it important that we still eat even if we're not hungry? Yeah. Well, it's essential to eat adequate protein mm -hmm. if you're looking to maintain or build your muscle mass. It's also important to get enough nutrients just for overall optimal hormonal health. Yeah. 
Um, one of the tips that I will probably encourage my clients to do is to prioritize the first meal of the day. Mm. See if you can get a good amount of protein in that first meal, anything okay. from 30 to 40 grams. Mm. Any woman who's over the age of 40, I generally push towards 40 grams plus because it's harder for us to utilize protein. Okay. If you can get the first meal of the day mm -hmm. out the way, it makes the rest of the day easier. Yeah. Ideally, you'd have three servings of, of protein during the day. Mm -hmm. And if you're struggling with appetite, you're feeling full and you don't really want to chew food, mm -hmm. sometimes liquid food can be an, another option. I'm not mm -hmm. advocating that you eat a protein shake for every meal, but it can serve a purpose if people just generally are not eating enough food and mm -hmm. in particular not eating enough protein. Mm, great tips. Yes, I think that's a really difficult one as well. So um, then the other thing is because we also you're also encouraging as doctors, we also encourage being physically active because a lot of these strategies actually help set them up for success for future sustainable weight yeah. loss. But sometimes because if they're, you're not eating enough, you kind of feel really weak. So what are some of the strategies that, that can help their performance? <laughs> I, I'm pretty strict, actually. I have a, a rule that if you come and train with me, you can't come in unfueled. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, again, it doesn't need to be a lot. Like the research is showing us that just 15 grams of protein before a strength workout is adequate mm -hmm. um, so that the body does not feel like it is uh, without nutrition and without fuel for the workout. And if you're doing any kind of endurance um, work or cardiovascular work on top, up to 30 grams of carbs. So mm -hmm. you can get a fairly small, neat meal before your mm -hmm. workout that will give you enough nutrition to fuel you for the workout. And then again, it's in encouraging those people to replenish after the workout for optimal recovery. Well, wonderful. Thank you. That's a great tip. Yes, <laughs> we definitely are into our intensity and performance when we train because it is not easy to build muscle tissue <laughs> despite all the very easy to lose. <laughs> this is this is this will bring us to the next question is basically when we talk about weight, we often I mean as doctors, we have to use the BMI because that's the clinical indication. But beyond that, when I look at things holistically, I'm also looking at good, healthy, functional um, longevity, which means preserving lean muscle mass. So basically, um, we need to talk a bit more than just BMI. We want to talk about basically body composition. Yeah. And actually, that's a question um, for, for you. Like we see a lot of influencers mm -hmm. talking about how these weight loss drugs are causing muscle loss. Yeah. Could you dive into that a bit more? Yes. So there is a lot of confusion about this. And the thing is, people who work with um, obesity patients know that when anyone loses a significant amount of weight, they're also going to lose some of that in terms of lean tissue. So regardless of whether or not you use medication, any other strategy, whether it's intensive lifestyle intervention, um, is going to cause some lean muscle loss. So we accept that and we know about this. Yeah. So this is the reason why it's so important to be physically active, work with a nutritionist and have ways to monitor your body composition. So that's different to a BMI yeah. because yeah. as you can explain to me, like why that is different. <laughs> So BMI is effectively a measurement that is used globally, actually, but it is factored or is an equation based off your height and your body weight. So um, I think you can quickly recognize that if you have a high body weight, but that's high in muscle, that's going to give you a higher BMI. And that obviously is not indicative of you car carrying excess body fat. Um, we have something we can share here. <laughs> which is uh, some body fat and some muscle. So this is two and a half pounds of fat and this is two and a half pounds of muscle. So muscle actually weighs more than fat, but it takes up less space. So if you were to lose two and a half pounds of fat, you'll lose a lot more mass. Mm -hmm. But if you were to gain two and a half pounds of fat, uh, muscle at the same time, your body weight might even be the same, if not heavier. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's really important to know that when it comes to body composition, yep. You don't want to be looking at the number on the scale. You don't necessarily want to be looking at BMI. You want to be looking at your um, how your clothes fit you. Mm -hmm. Tape measure and anthropometric measurements I find mm -hmm. super helpful. How you feel, how you look in your skin. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for those tips. <laughs> I think the other important um, take home message about body composition is to maintain your muscle mass as much as you can in a fat loss phase um, and to reduce your fat mass. You really need to be looking at 
at ensuring you have adequate protein from your diet and ensuring that you're resistance training. And the research is clear on this point that those two factors will help mitigate the loss of the muscle mass, which is we've just discussed to a certain extent will be unavoidable. One question I hear a lot talked about mm -hmm. from um, social media and just in general is, are these drugs an easy way out? And can people stay on these drugs forever? Mm -hmm. What would be the, the solution once they've got to their goal weight? Okay, so in answer to the first part of the question, the short answer is no, it's not an easy way out. Um, I think we need to start changing our mindsets about obesity and people living with obesity because we now recognize that um, there are multiple components to it, including genetics, yeah. hormonal changes, biochemical changes, because we now understand that um, fat tissue also is a metabolic organ in and of itself which can be very inflammatory. And there are also neurobiological um, and behavioral aspects to weight loss, which is much more complex than the equation of calories in, calories out. Yeah. So you know, doctors like us have been managing obesity for a very long time. And many of these patients have done every single diet under the yeah. sun. You understand that this is not something which um, is easy for everybody. So patients who are adopting this approach they're doing it in conjunction with lifestyle it's not yeah. a replacement and a lot of them actually already understand that yeah so it's a tool on top of lifestyle all doctors understand this and they will counsel their doc uh, the patients accordingly so when we look at the studies all these patients in the studies are having dietitians they're having follow-up with their doctors they're actually doing activity as well so they're all doing the lifestyle interventions and that's why it's successful yeah so i always say you have a tool but to make the most out of the tool you also need to incorporate other foundational aspects to it yeah i, I would agree with that mm -hmm. um i heard uh, on a on a podcast recently someone described losing body fat as for some people as easy as changing the color of your hair or your style of your hair and for some people it's like trying to change your height mm -hmm. and having worked with hundreds of men and women but predominantly women I would say that's absolutely true and to your point there are so many um, people who are give it absolutely all that they can and yet the, the number on the scale yeah. do doesn't move so these weight loss uh, drugs become a really powerful tool to help that that number start to shift but the most important part is implementing all of the lifestyle strategies alongside it during that process yeah. because the process to lose body fat can take a while but mm -hmm. the process to um, create and and engage new lifestyle sustainable habits also takes time so if you can do those all at the same time the goal is at the end of it mm -hmm. um, you continue with these lifestyle habits which yeah. will help you to maintain mm -hmm. what you have achieved I agree totally 100% <laughs> it's about the long term <laughs> it is because none of us um, want to get to a certain size or a certain weight but at the same time compromise our long-term health mm -hmm. i.e have less muscle mass yeah. um, not had enough nutrients um, we want to be the very best version of ourselves so I guess the question is um, for you like what are some of the successful strategies that you've mm -hmm. seen in your clients who've actually lost the weight and have managed to keep it off I think um, the creation of good daily habits, which you're consistent with, is the absolute key to success. Mm -hmm. So um, with, a, with some people, it might be as simple as just making sure you hit 10,000 steps a day. Yeah. It could be as simple as when you prepare your meals, you make sure you have protein at every meal. Mm -hmm. It could be a, a rule that you only have carbohydrates, you know, processed carbs or white carbs in and around a workout so yeah. that they get utilized quickly and effectively by the muscles. And that's when you can get to enjoy your carbs. Yeah, favorite you get to enjoy your carbs. We love our pre-workout yeah. carbs um, and post-workout carbs. Um, but it's these small little changes that add up to big change over the long term. But the more you do it, the more consistent you are, the more they become part of who you are and you don't even think about it anymore. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I've seen um, be the most impactful long term um, and making it part of your life, making it part of um, what is important to you and a priority and also bringing other people in your life mm. into it. Like you can't, it's very challenging to yeah. sustain this if your partner is on the sofa eating McDonald's frequently and <laughs> I joke but it happens so you know getting the people who are close to involved in your life um, to be on board with these same long-term healthy strategies just benefits everyone and I also think you are talking about a really key point which often I think is missed out in a lot of these discussions on um, creating ha positive habits mm. because we can have a lot of willpower but the willpower isn't something that's 
often reliable. It does require、um, basically the accountability and conditioning over time、yeah. with the small、um, steps. Um, that you can take to remind yourself、um, why you're doing these things and for what reason. Because it、yep. ultimately, I think when I think about those patients who've been able to stay off or maintain their weight, they've worked out、um, how they're going to be accountable for themselves. Yeah, accountability、so, is a big one, actually. Yeah, I think it's important to have someone who's an expert to guide you through that at first, because、yeah. I think sometimes we assume that knowing something means you're going to act on it and do it. But that's not often the case, and if it was, we would all be, you know, healthy and optimal.、Um, but I think that's a skill, and I think we don't necessarily all have that skill. But having a health coach、mm. is someone who actually helps to bring out that skill in you. Set of skill sets like、yeah. nutrition, they might not necessarily have those practical skills, or they might not be able to, you know, straight off the bat find the perfect way to remind them or to.、Yeah. Have the resources, so having a person guide you through that process, so you're learning as you're going as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So you understand the why behind it. Yeah,、um, yeah. I agree. Accountability <laughs> is key. <laughs> Come work with me. Yeah, <laughs> you will discover, and like I discovered when I first started、yeah. um, strength training, I hate exercise. <laughs> and this is the woman that can deadlift three times my body weight. So. <laughs> But you know what happened was、um, I took a very small step. I, I did something else first. I,、yeah. I loved music, so I actually decided that I would、um, join a class that had great music, and then that was the reason why I went to the class was for the music. <laughs> and so during that process,、nice. I learned I could do these things, and、yeah. that gave me confidence because I could do something that I found really difficult, but I could enjoy it. So it then springboarded off from there. And now today. Um, that's my lifestyle. I use strength training now as a barometer of my mental health, as a way to、um, kind of check in with myself.、Yeah. And I can't think of me not ever being able to do that. Yes,、yeah. it's really interesting the power of any kind of training with your mental health,、um, and in particular with strength training. I see it in myself. Like I know how much it lifts my mood and my spirits, my energy, and my confidence when I've trained in the gym, lifting weights specifically.、Mm-hmm. Um, and I see it with the clients that I work with, and、yeah. a, and a lot of the women that I work with are sort of perimenopause, menopause.、Mm-hmm. Brain fog is a real issue. Joint pain is a real issue. Lethargy is a real issue. And almost without exception. By the time that hour has finished in the gym, the eyes are brighter, the energy is lifted. They walk out with their head held high, and that is the power、mm-hmm. of strength training. I truly believe. My own personal anecdote: going through perimenopause is one of the hardest things I've ever had to face in my life journey,、yeah. even harder than medical school. So, <laughs> so I have、yeah. to really say that if it wasn't for having those、um, habits already in place, that I could. Leverage off、um, when I was mentally and physically tired, and、yeah. you know, just having brain fog and and all these sort of aches and pains,、um, which went from you know me training six days a week to even just once every two weeks was really extremely tough.、Um, I had those things laid down as groundwork that I could actually hang on for a, a while. Yeah.、Um, in that space, I, I don't know how I could have gotten through it. So I actually don't think that this is just for perimenopause. I think every woman at any age,、yeah. it's something to think about for your future health and longevity. That you can start with these small things and small changes.、Yeah. Think a bit about how to take care of yourself. Yeah, prioritize your your sleep, your nutrition, your movement, your strength training. Yeah, <laughs> and your friendship circle. Very much so. <laughs>